Okay, now for something slightly different. I want to talk to you about how I created an explorable visualization design space. So what I wanted to do was try to understand the good, the bad, and the common data visualization solutions that people were already using to visualize genomic epidemiology data. And so what I wanted to do was systematically uh, mine and describe these visualization solutions. And to do that, I created something called a visualization design space and an open source tool called the Gavit Online Gallery that allows people to actually browse and see what I've done here. The motivation for this project was actually reading a whole bunch of different research papers and seeing that for a common problem, people visualize data differently. So behind me are three examples of data visualizations drawn from papers for a hospital outbreak. They're shown differently. They use different data. Which one might be right in a different context? I also saw a lot of great examples of really, really complicated data visualizations. Is this good? Is this bad? Is this necessary? I didn't know. So I thought to myself, the little Lego person is me, can I come up with a method to systematically review data visualizations, not just what people like, but how they're created and why? And I thought, what if I take this method and apply it to research papers for microbial genomic epidemiology? What would I find? So that is what I did. I created a method that has two phases. The first is a literature analysis phase, and the second is a visualization analysis phase. And within the visualization analysis phase, I employ both a qualitative and a quantitative analysis. Some aspects of this method are fully automated, that's the little robot, and some aspects, like the qualitative analysis phase, require a lot of human and manual curation. That was, you know, student in the loop. And each of these different phases answer a different research question. The literature analysis phase was about trying to figure out why are people visualizing data in the first place, for example, a hospital outbreak. The visualization analysis phase was first in the qualitative part to figure out how people are visualizing data and then to quantify how many examples there are of specific data visualization strategies. So let me tell you really briefly what we did in the literature analysis phase. I got about 18,000 articles from PubMed that were about genomic epidemiology. I took the title and the abstracts and I came up with an unsupervised topic clustering method. The results of this method are shown behind me, and what I found was that the biggest signal in the data is basically pathogen. Now this was interesting. Maybe people visualize pathogens different, uh, differently. They have different transmission routes and different effects. To also capture this variety, I actually use these topic clusters as strata in an unsupervised sampling schema. So what I did was from 18,000 articles, sample 221 across all these articles, and then I had 801 figures that I analyzed further. That was because the next stage in the visualization analysis is qualitative. Remember, student in the loop, I am not a machine that can analyze 18,000 figures. So what I did was I extracted figures from each of the articles that I sampled. Um, figures were not tied to any specific tool, so they could be created in any way, including PowerPoint, which, by the way, happens a lot. I used something from social sciences called iterative and axial coding to actually annotate parts of these data visualizations and try to figure out how people created them. I analyzed figures together if they were multi-part figures because I thought maybe there's a strategy here. The result is something that I call GEVIT, a genomic epidemiology visualization typology that describes how these visualizations were created according to chart types, combinations, and enhancements. So one thing I found was there are a lot of different charts that form the basis of these visualizations. If you think of your favorite tool, they might support one or two types of charts, like a phylogenetic tree or your common statistical charts. Very few tools support all of this uh, kinds of figures together. The most common thing to do was actually to show a tree with a lot of text. So a lot of data was not visualized. That's a problem. I also saw that people combine data in a lot of ways. Often it was just a single chart, but they were often doing much more complex things that we could see was a systematic pattern. This is one example that you might see a lot, which we call a spatially aligned combination. Very rarely were people just throwing things together, which is our unaligned combination. We also saw that people enhanced things in very specific ways. So you'd have a base chart type, you might re recolor the lines, add points, or add annotations. So this was our method. I've actually released this online as an open source tool at gavit.net. 
And what it does is actually provide you a base to do further evaluations on what kind of data visualizations might be appropriate for different contexts. It doesn't answer that question yet. I have two more slides before I end. So uh, the next steps, we've actually used this knowledge from our Gavit repository to inform the design and development of two tools called MinCombiner and Gavit Rec that help fill in some of these gaps. And if you're actually interested in participating in a user study, you can contact me online here. So in conclusion, data visualization is complex and requires a research effort. We need better tools, and the Gavit Gallery is a starting point for helping people out. This is also an interesting problem at the intersection of human-computer interaction and bioinformatics, which is a different way that we can test our software. Thanks very much. <laughs>